so good. Hey, yo, I love you so much. I'm so glad to be in the new year. Um, you know, we're, we're starting this brand new series, as you see, Own the Vision. And we're going to be kicking that off today. I'm very excited for all that God has in store for us. Before I jump into it, though, I wanted to remind you, because maybe the holidays, some things have slipped. Listen, the moment you walked through those four doors, you belong in your family. Can you just make some noise right now? Maybe it's your first time. Maybe you've been here a hundred times. You belong in your family. And we exist as a youth group and a church to help all people realize that God loves them unconditionally. Can I tell you something right off the press? Like, this is hot. This is real hot. We've got, we've got a high school campus launching next Tuesday. Yeah. Come on. LP, Lincoln Park, they're going to be launching. There it is. And Woo! I tell you, listen how awesome this is. So we're launching on Tuesday, and there's a reason why I'm telling you this, so many reasons. We're launching on Tuesday, and, and so the way that they have it set up, you've got to sign up to be there, okay? And we've got 40 students signed up to be there. Isn't that awesome? And let me tell you, here, here's the real good news. Here's the real good news. Only two students that are going are ours. Two, 38 students are coming. Will you believe something with me? Will you believe in that we see miracles, that we see people get saved, that we see people, come on, set free and whole? Will you believe that with me? That is incredible. And it, it just what God is doing is so awesome. And, and, you know, that's why we exist, to help all people realize that God loves them unconditionally. And it doesn't have to stay contained in these four walls. Amen? Amen. So we're starting a, vi a, a series today, tonight, called Own the Vision. Own the Vision. I'm so excited about it because, because we're talking about the vision that God has for us personally. Like in our lives, how do we, where are we going? Where are we going personally? And then what, is, what does God have for our church family? What does that look like? And I really believe that for us, for you and I personally, what God's going to do tonight is going to basically line us up like a chiropractor. Just and he's going he's to set us up on the path that we should be going. How many of us want vision? Anybody ever feel like, I just wish somebody would tell me what to do? Like, just, would you make it easy? Lay it out for me. Tell me what to do. Where do I go next? And, 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 but here's what happens to so many of us. We go and it's like, if you were to leave tonight and you go get in the car, you just get in the car and you turn the key and you start driving down the road. And, and people are like, where are you going? I, I don't know. We're just driving. And you find yourself on the highway driving for a long time and all of a sudden you run out of gas. Because you never had a destination planned. You didn't have vision for where you were going. What does this year look like? And, and so we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about that because God has a destination for us, one that you don't run out of gas. God's got something for you. So we're going to open up our Bibles to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Now, let me give you some context for what we're about to read. This is a letter being written from Paul. Now, he's a fantastic church leader, and, and so he's in a city called Rome, and he's writing from his jail cell to a city called Ephesus. Writing from jail to, to Ephesus, and, and so he's writing this letter. He's basically saying, hey, listen, guys, this is about the church that you and I should be. This is how we should be. This is, this is the church that God has called us to become. He's giving vision. He's giving clarity. This is what we need to do. This is who we need to be. This right here is vision for you and I. This is vision for our life. Somebody say, it's vision for me. And so I say that to lay the groundwork. Like, you know, let me give you a little bit more context. Paul, previously, in, in the first three chapters of Ephesians, he, he basically laid out the position of a believer, that as believers of Jesus Christ, that once you believe in Jesus, you're now positioned in forgiveness, that you're now positioned in grace, and that you, you, are the, you, you are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. The Bible says that we are seated in heavenly places. So in other words, what was isn't what is. And God thinks so highly of you that he says, hey, 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 your family, I call you friend. That's good news. So, so I say that to throw it out, to now get to chapter 4. And we're going to read the first seven verses in the NIV. NIV translation. And then I'm going to skip a whole bunch of vers uh, uh, verses, and we're going to jump down actually into the 20s, and we're going to look at it in the message. Yeah, somebody, the message version. And we'll end in verses 30 and 32. And so if you're in Ephesians 4 chapter, Ephesians 4, not a chapter, 
That is the chapter. Verse 1. Somebody say yeah. Some of you said, yeah, you don't even have your Bibles open. I'm just telling you, you don't even have your phone open. Okay, I got you. If you're with me, say, yeah. yeah. The Bible says this. As a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Somebody say, I've been called. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is only one body and one spirit, just as you were called the one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now watch this in verse 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. That's good. Let's skip down to verse 20, the message version. It says, but that's no life for you. You've learned Christ. My assumption is that you have paid careful attention to him, Jesus, been well instructed in the truth, truth precisely as we have it in Jesus. Since then, we do, not, we do not have the excuse of ignorance. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way, the old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it. And then take on an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God, watch this, as God accurately reproduces his character in you. And then we're going to jump to verse 30. Don't grieve God. Don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. Make a clean break with all cutting, backbiting, prof profane talk, profanity, some versions say. You could say cursing. Be gentle with one another, sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly as, watch this, as God in Christ forgave you. Come on, can we praise God right now that he quickly forgave you and me? He didn't wait. Anybody grateful tonight that he was quick to forgive us of our sins? That's good news. I want to preach a message today, and I hope that you write down the title. It's called Owning the Vision for Your Life. Owning the Vision for Your Life. And as we talk about this, we're talking about our new norm. This is our new norm today. Our new normal. This is the new normal. And I want to pray and I'm believing that today, that in service, that, that God's going to come. He's going to encourage you. I believe that when you leave this room, this building, this live stream, that you're going to be built up. That God's going to do something so sweet that we're going to leave better than we came in. And I'm believing that as you walk out these doors, that you're going to leave with some fresh faith tonight. Some excitement for your week. Some excitement for your year and for your life. And, and a belief that God is not against you, but a belief that God is for you. You believe that with me tonight. And so we're going to pray. Um, let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you so much for everybody under the sound of my voice. Lord, I thank you for the good work that you're doing in this room. Father, anything that's from me, let it fall to the ground, produce nothing. Jesus, I thank you that your word, let it take root in our hearts tonight. Father, I thank you that you've called us, you've chosen us. You've got great plans in store for us. Father, we lean into that today. And I thank you that, that you're a God that gives hope. Lord, that you're a God that gives a future. So I thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in us and through us. In your wonderful name, everybody said amen, amen and amen. So I need, I need some crowd participation for a second. I need to see your hands if you're someone that likes something new. You're like, you're like do it. Anybody in here, let me see your hands. Let me be more specific. If you like new shoes. Anybody in here? Come on. Yeah, there it is. All the girls, you just guys were quick. What was that about? I don't know. And so like, and so I, I just like, I love getting new shoes. There's, there's something, there's something about a new pair of shoes. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're just a fit and they, there ain't nothing better in the whole entire world than new shoes. And can I just get a witness at church? Come on, give me an amen or something. Okay. And so there's something about new, something about a new car smell. 
something about new carpet and, and a new outfit. Come on, somebody. Like, you get the new, yeah, you're like, come on, holla at your boy. And anybody just like new things. And, and so no one likes to go and, like, smell old shoes. You're like, no, no. But the new smell, you're like, okay, there it is. Like, mm, there's just something about it. New outfits. And, and it's all about new. Like, we, we love new. If we're honest with ourselves, dude, when you get the plastic on the phone and you pull it off, come on. It's your birthday. You know what I'm saying? Like, you just, you love it. You're like, oh, leave all the plastic on for me. Like, you know what I mean? And, and we love new. And I want to talk today about God actually inviting us to get out with the old and in with the new. This week, Alyssa and I, we got new furniture. Now, we've got two kids, Eli James Archer and Mila Catalina. And so we just, we, get, we have a whole lot of fun. And, and so 18 months old. And a four-year-old, let me tell you, there's some things that end up in the couch and on the couch that I don't know what they are. Okay, some things that start to grow, some things that give you the heebie-jeebies. So we had like this, like this really nice, um, big, long corner couch inside our living room. And it got to the point where like, it was like the color of our chairs, like a cream color, but, but it wasn't a cream color anymore, if you know what I mean. Like it was brown. Like, it looked like sin and death. It, 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 like, like we were finding cheer Cheerios and then whatever they morphed into and grew into and like had legs and feet okay it's just like it was crazy and, and so like just we got to the point where we just couldn't clean it anymore and we both said you know we gotta let this thing go we gotta we gotta get it out we gotta we gotta let this thing and so we got new furniture shifted some things around and, and so the couch had to go the bible is teaching us that you how to get out with the old and in with the new this new life this new creation you know we have 10 high school campuses right now Ten. It's incredible. This last month in December, we had 14 salvations across those campuses. Isn't that incredible? That's people saying, I'm new. I'm new to Christ. I'm, I'm new. I'm a new creation. The Bible is teaching us here in chapter four what a new life looks like for you and me. I love number one. Get ready to write this down. And, and, and in fact, we'll go back to, to verse number one. And before we do, remember, Paul is basically, he's now tipping us to the activity of a believer. There's more to just believing in Jesus. There's a side of go and do. There's a side. We, we co-labor in Christ. So he's tipping us to the activity of the believer right here. And so he's basically saying, if you're going to do this Jesus thing, this is where the rubber meets the road. This, this is where the gas starts. This is direction for you, direction for me. Now watch how he starts. He goes, therefore now walk and live a life worthy of your calling. Can you write down number one today? Live at the level you're called, not just at the level that you are. We're to live at the level that we're called, not just the level that we are. I love, I love that thought because he's saying, guys, you know, you, you, you need to, you should live a life worthy of your calling. Most of us, we live it where we are. I'm at this place in school, so I'm, you know, I'm just gonna continue to do this thing, my schooling, and this is where I'm at, this is the bar. I'm meeting it, I'm going. I'm at this place with my friend group, this is where we are. I'm at this place with my family. I'm at this place in my dating relationship. I'm at this place, and, and so I live where I'm at. But the Bible is teaching us not to live where we are, but to live where we're called. Maybe you didn't even know that you were called, but every follower of Jesus Christ, God has called you. God has called you by name. God, if God knit you in your mother's womb, was present when you were being handcrafted, knows every hair that's on your head, how could you think he didn't give you a calling? How could you think that he doesn't have a plan and a purpose for your life? No, 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 no. You have been called. There's a calling for every single believer in this room. There's a huge calling on your life, and, and you've got a magnificent calling. I'm talking about the calling to be a Christian. That's what I'm talking about. And you and I, we are called as believers of Jesus that when you become a Christian, you receive the, the greatest high call of God. What is the high call of God? What does that look like? It's to be holy because he is holy. It's to live in righteousness because he, he, he has given us righteousness. We are called to be the salt of the earth. 
We are called to be the light of the world. We are called to be the chosen generation. We are called to be his royal priesthood. We are called to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. Anybody thankful today that you didn't have to try to get a call? You just have to receive the call. That's good news. You ever hear that phrase? Don't call us. We'll call you. Well, God has called you. God has called you. And he's called you to something huge, something so powerful. And, and I just wonder if you're going to believe that you're called. Or are you going to actually receive that you're called? It's one thing to believe it. It's one thing to hear me say it, to read it in your Bible. It's a whole next level to receive it and actually own it. I grew up in a home where, where my mom and my dad, they were very assuring to me. Um, for, ever since I was little, my mom and dad, they would always say, there's just something different about you. Even when my other brothers were in the room, I'm like, mom, you really shouldn't say this. Like, they're here, you know? And she's like, yeah, but you're like Joseph. There's just something different. You're just blessed. And I'm like, I receive it in Jesus' name, but sorry, bros. Like, you know what I mean? You get what you get, okay? It is what it is. And, and, but I grew up where, where my parents all, like jokes aside, I, I grew up, my parents were like, you're, there's something different. You're a leader. You're, 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 I grew up in a home where my parents were like, I just feel like you're, you're called to influence, you're a leader. My mom and dad, they would tell me that I, I was going to be a world changer. I'm like, what the heck is a world changer? I didn't, you know, but, but I have this sense that I'm called. It's one thing to believe it. It's another thing to actually own it. When I was 23 years old, I made the decision to start owning the call that's on my life. Listen. Let me liken it this way. Just because you know somebody that's a father and they have the reality of having the fruit of having kids doesn't, doesn't mean that they're a father. Just because they're a father doesn't mean that they are owning that responsibility of being a father. And some of us, we, we, we go, I've been called. I've got this calling. I believe it. But I, I'm going to ask you, have you actually received it? Have you actually received your calling? Are you owning your calling? Do you walk worthy of your calling? Because when you are called, and as a believer of Jesus, we are all called, you don't live with the majority. You live in the minority. The crowd's going one way, and we make the decision that, hey, I'm going to do it God's way. Because when you're called to be a believer of Jesus... You give up what the rest of the world is doing. See, the rest of the world, they, they live one way. But, but we, you and I, are called to live above the fray. We're called to live above the world. We are called to, to, the world will go and do whatever they want with their finances. But you and I, we send, our, we send our money. We build the kingdom. We do it through kingdom builders, right? Building and helping other people. We do things different. The rest of the, the world, the, the, everybody, they do what they want in dating relationships, but you and I have made the decision to abstain from sex before marriage. We've made the decision to abstain and stay away from pornography. We've made the decision to abstain from anything sexual, anything before marriage because we live in, in, in purity in our relationships. That's the calling that we've stepped into. That's the life that we live. Am I preaching to anybody that doesn't just believe that they're called, but, but somebody who wants to receive the calling of God on their life? Come on, somebody. He says, therefore, walk worthy of your calling. I just wonder right now, are you walking and living a life worthy of your calling? When you believe that you, that you have the responsibility of a high call, you lose the rights to do this, that, and the other. Something shifts. I don't have the right to just spend money any way that I want to. I don't have the right to just steward my time any way that I want to. I, my talents are not my own. Why? Because I have a high calling. The greater my calling, the greater the responsibility. The more responsibility, the less rights I have. When you start to realize that you've been called to live a life worthy of my calling, you will act different. There will be an intentionality. There's a difference between believing and behaving. It's one word, it's one, it's one thing to, to, to speak something, but do you put your money where your mouth is? I was meeting with somebody the other day and, 
And so I just wanted to catch up and see how, hey, you know, how are things going and how, how are you? And, and they were telling me, oh, I'm in this new relationship. And, and I'm like, okay, that's really cool. And, and, and so it just it dropped in my heart and I just had this, uh, just dropped right in my heart. I said, hey, listen, are, are you guys abstaining from sex? I just want to know. And, and I just feel like the Lord put that on my heart. How can I help? And, and he said, you know, we, we don't really have any boundaries in, in our relationship to, to help us do it God's way. And I said, well, I, I'll help. Can I help? And he, he's like, no, yeah, I have to process that. I have, I have to think if that's the best thing for us. I said, hey, at, at what point do you think that you're going to allow all of these beliefs in Jesus to transfer over to behaving differently? At what point do we make the decision that we say, I'm not just a hearer of the word, I'm going to become a doer of the word. When the Bible talks about our behavior, the Bible is talking about living according to a godly lifestyle. Being a reflection of our calling. I hope and pray that at Sozo, that people around our city, people around our schools can tell that you are living a different life by the fruit that you have. There's just something different about you. That you don't live the life of the majority, you live the life of the minority, minority. Have you received a high calling? Have you actually received who God is calling you to be. Come on, somebody, can you put your hands together and just thank God that, that we can live a life worthy of the call yeah. and what God has for us in our church? Yeah. Yeah. Watch this. Paul said, I hope that you live a life worthy of the call. And then Paul goes that this is what you should do. He gets even more practical. Watch this. Be because you have such a high calling, let me help you. Anybody need vision for your life? What do I do this year? How do I, how do I up my game? What does that look like? Watch this. Because, because you have such a high calling, here, you need to treat people with respect. You need to be kind and considerate. You, you need to treat people with authenticity. Forgive people. Love people. Be tender-hearted. The way that I fulfill the great high calling is the way that I steward my relationships and my relationship with him. If you had to boil it down, how's this year look going into 2021, uh, 2022? Lord, we went backwards, huh? So I, I pray that, that you feel like you're being called into something. Listen, the way that I treat other humans and the way that I act amongst my school, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. God's got big plans for us. That high calling has nothing to do with a microphone or a worship song. It has everything to do that we treat students at school, that we, we treat our teachers our people in the community, our bodies, our family members, our relationship with God. Come on, praise God if you believe that you've got a high calling. Come on, let's make some noise for him right now. And it's to treat people with dignity. The world is losing that. But you're not called to be like the world. You're not called to, to, to just fit in. You're called to stand out. And then watch this in verse 7. It says something so powerful, so big. Because your great calling is to treat people with respect, to love people, to be tender-hearted and forgiving, to put all that craziness behind you, to live this new life. Watch this. He said, he said that each one of us has received a grace decided by God. You've received grace. I want to confess something over your life. I want to confess something over your home, over your life this week. Maybe you need to put this as a screensaver on your phone. Maybe you need to wake up every day and you need to speak this over yourself. Whatever you got to do this week. But I would write down number two today. Confess that I have a grace. I've got a grace. I've got a grace. I came to tell somebody today that you've got a grace from heaven. You've got a grace from heaven. You've got a grace from God. You know, when God gives you something, no one can take it away. Grace, what is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is what God extends to you and I. And then there's also another side of grace. So one is you and I get this grace, God loves us. And, but then the other side is he actually gives us a, a gift deposit, a grace gift. In fact, you could combine those two words together, grace and gift. What is that for you? What, what is it when, when, Ben, how do I, how do you know when you're walking in grace? How do you, how do you know? What is that? It's when the wind of heaven is at your back and you can feel it. What is it for you? Is it administration? Is it academics? Is it leading people? Is it being an athlete? Is it, is it music? Is it engineering? Is it worship? What, what has God graced you to do? Because I've learned in life 
I don't tolerate my lane, I celebrate my lane. Grace has your gifting. That you actually, you can couple those two words, grace and gift, because when God gives you a grace gift, listen, by the way, it is not our business to decide whether God has given us one talent, three talents, or five talents. In fact, Jesus tell this, tells the parable of the talents, and he says, one guy, he's, got, he's gotten one, the other, he's gotten two, and, and the other, he's gotten five. And I don't care if you got one, two, or five. I don't care. At least you got a talent. God loves you so much, he has given you a talent. And by the way, I've learned in life, I have learned that just because I'm over here with one talent, and that's what I got, okay? I can, I can blow bubbles with my nose, all right? Just because I'm over here, I'm not going to pout about it. I'm not, I'm not going to complain. You know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to get in someone's car, this thing called life, find out where they're going. They got five, five talents. We're rolling. We're rolling together. We're going to combine. We got six. Let's go. We're going to partner in life. Stop complaining about your talent. And partner with other people's talents. And, and I would just start saying that I've got a grace. I've got a God-given ability. When you do this, when you, oh, I'm good at this thing. When you, when you begin to do that, listen, I've, I've got a really narrow gift mix. Really narrow. Like, I can preach, teach, and I can identify and empower leaders. That's like, you know, my gifting is to preach and teach and lead other people. And, and, and when I'm in that lane, when I'm doing that, me, Ben Archer. I feel the wind of heaven at my back. In fact, if you were to ask me to publicly speak, I can't. Well, that's what you're doing right now, Pastor Ben. That's because you're seeing God's grace gift on my life manifesting right before your eyes. You have a gift. All of us have a gift. We make up the body of Christ. See, this isn't a talent. This is a gift because I, I can't do this without, with, without it. I can't do it. I've learned to receive my gift and the walk in my gift away. Can I just ask you, do you believe that you've got a grace gift? Do you believe that? When you receive the grace that's on your life, you'll start to use it to help others. You'll start to use it to build the church. You'll start to use it to edify other people. The grace that we receive is not for you and me. It's always for others. It's always for other people. This is exciting stuff. And, and so we went through all of this to land at the tipping point of the chapter. As we get ready to close today, that you can walk worthy of your calling. You can walk in your grace zone and you can live a life that is flourishing, fresh, and exciting. If you receive your call and receive your grace. Now watch, Paul, Paul continues on, he says something amazing in the middle of chapter 4, and, and in fact, we're going to skip over that, and so I encourage you to go back and read Ephesians 4, and so I'm trusting you this week, but we're going to go back to verse 20, now watch, watch how Paul's going to talk. He begins to talk about putting off the old man and putting on the new man, and he says here in chapter 4, verse 21, since then we do not excuse, we do not have the excuse of ignorance. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with the old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it. Then take on an entirely new life, a God-fashioned life. A renewed, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your what? Into your what? Into your conduct. You could say your lifestyle. Into your lifestyle. He's saying that if you put off the old and you put on the new, would you write down number three today? And, and the worship team, they're going to help me sound spiritual here. Number three, putting on the new man and taking off the old. Putting on the new man and taking off the old. I love this so much because the reality for all of us is that we've got to put on the new man. We've got to put on the new man. Taking off the old putting on the new, getting rid of the old. I'm telling you that couch that we had, it had to go in the name of Jesus. Sin and death, it was bad. Some of you ought to get rid of that old life. Did you hear what the Bible saying to you? It's rotten, it's like rotten tomatoes. It's like rotten bananas. Have you ever smelled something rotten? I have two children, we've got diapers. I know, I, you know what I'm saying, rotten, okay? 
so your old life is, is so rotten. Sleeping around, doing this, that, and the other, being mean, gossip, cruel, spirited, being so harsh, all that backbiting and profanity. Got to get out with the old to get in with the new. New. In, the, in November, my family came over. And Alyssa and I, we were kind of shocked because it was like a surprise. We didn't know what they wanted to meet with us about. And so uh, they, they came over. And, and prior to that, I literally was telling Alyssa, I said, hey, I got to get rid of this old, old winter coat. It's about to be cold. I, I don't like the cold, okay? I hate the cold. I don't like it, but we're here in Pennsylvania. Florida's not an option, okay? I hate the cold. I'm like, we got to get rid of this old coat. I've had it for like six or seven years now. It's like, it's just... I mean, it works, it's fine, but I want something new, I want something nice, I want something like black and makes me look thinner, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, yeah, hide, hide, hide it, you know what I'm saying? I'm getting older, I'm like, so, and she's like, okay, we'll start saving, coats aren't cheap. And so my family, we, hey, we gotta come over, I'm like, oh gosh, you know, everybody got some crazy in their family? Okay, I'm like, oh gosh, Amen. we gotta come over, it's like an emergency. Amen. First, I'm like, did anybody die? Okay, nobody died, okay. What, what do you all need? Like, what did I screw up? You know what I'm saying? What, complaints. Just send it in a letter, you know what I mean? Like, and so they all they all come and and they've got these boxes and they come with all these gifts and they said, hey, we won't be able to meet with you before Christmas and and all of a sudden I start going through it and the very first thing I open up is this big black winter coat and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me! I'm like, Alyssa, Alyssa, it's black, like we said. They didn't have to buy it. They bought it. Could you believe it? I put this thing on. I'm like, what? I'm standing in front of the mirror, I'm like, yes, I look thinner. Thank you, Jesus. Like, you know, I'm just like, wow, this is incredible. I feel so good. And there's something about taking off the old and putting on the new. The Bible doesn't just teach us what to put off. It tells us what to put on. What to put on. I'm thankful today that when I step into this new norm, that I'm putting new things on that God has for me. I'm clothing myself in righteousness. I'm living in holiness. I'm living in praise and I'm putting on all these things. Are you thankful today that we can take off the old stuff and we can put on the new? That old you is rotten. Get rid of it. Put it in the dumpster. It's done. That old phone number that you need to delete. Get rid of it. What's that old relationship that that's holding you back from what God has for you and where he's taking you, that you need, to step, you need to step away from. What's that old habit that you always go to when you're furious? What is it? Get rid of it. It's rotten in the name of Jesus. It's corrupt in the name of Jesus. And, and you've got to put on that new. There's something about that new smell. There's something about that new you. Something's different about you. I know. I see it. As we walk into this year, and we're wondering what's in store for us this year. Don't you settle for what was. You take what's new. Amen? It's a new day. New smell, new creation. I've got some new, I've got some new lifestyles. I've, I've got a new confession. I've got a new reading plan. I'm ready to go. I might not be where I want to be, but thank you, Jesus, I'm not where I was. Oh, it's a new you. Anybody excited for the new day, the new adventure, putting off who we used to be and just receive, just receive tonight that you've got a huge life ahead of you. You've got a calling ahead of you. You've got a plan ahead of you and you might not know it right now, but God does. And you've got the grace to do this thing. You've got the grace to be a student. You've got the grace to lead in school. You've got the grace to do this thing called life. You do. You've got the grace to have right relationships. Know that you have a calling. Somebody say, I'm called. Somebody say, I'm called. And that calling has a grace that comes with it. And the walk in that God calling, we've got to take off the old man and we've got to put on the new man. And, and you might say, Pastor, that sounds cool. Could you just be more clear? Just, Pastor, I don't have a 4.0. I've got a 2.0. Pastor, just make it simple for me. Let me help you.
because I'm, I'm preaching to myself right now. Let me help you. As you actively seek the Lord, this is vision for your life. I pray that you're taking this all in. I've given you three steps, but as you actively seek the Lord, you will find him. And as you seek his kingdom, it will be added to you. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what I want to do when I graduate high school, pastor. I don't know what I want to do with my life, okay? You don't have to. You just, you just focus on right now. You just focus on being the godly man that God's calling you to be. And walking out what God has asked you to do. And you watch what's added to you. You know, it's, it's, boy, is the burden just taken off of you when I'm no longer the leader of my life that Jesus is. There's just no anxiety there. There's no stress. There's no pressure. And start walking this out. And I believe that when you do, you'll see that his word's a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. And in fact, some translations say he'll tell you where to go, which way to go. Own the vision, amen? Own the vision. Can we stand to our feet? We're going to come up. We're going to worship God. I believe that God's not done tonight. I believe God has more in store for you. So we're going to come up here. We're going to raise our hands. We're going to worship God. And I believe that even tonight that God has given you the grace deposit to do this Christian thing. Amen?